In 1970, Governor Ronald Reagan signed into law the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA. The law was meant to protect the environment from corporate and private interests. 47 years later, CEQA is used to stop countless public projects, often for reasons that have little to do with the environment. A quarter of CEQA lawsuits target taxpayer-funded projects, such as schools, parks, transit, and affordable housing. Oftentimes, what you'll see is the plaintiff is Friends of So-and-So, which is this made-up organization that has no real membership. It's just a front for either NIMBY groups or uh, labor unions um, who are abusing uh, CEQA in order to stop projects that don't cause any environmental harm. Only 13% of CEQA lawsuits had a recognizable environmental group, and they don't even have to disclose who they are when they sue. You can file a lawsuit to protect your competitive position. As happened, for example, at the University of California, when a competitor group called Conquest Housing called themselves the Al-Qaeda of CEQA and sued not just a competitor that was building a housing project at USC, but sued 11 other of the same competitor's project the existing Portola Middle School was deemed a seismically unsafe structure. And they wanted to move the kids to a prior elementary school. Two sets, I think, of students went through middle school in trailers, and the cost to those kids was never factored in. The law just doesn't recognize it. The misuse of CEQA has proven a contributing factor to California's current housing crisis. We're building about 100,000, 80,000 to 100,000 homes in California every year. We need closer to 180,000 a year, some say more. A third of all CEQA lawsuits target residential projects, which pose little to no threat to the environment. If we're going to actually build a state that's inclusive and welcoming for everyone, that's not just wealthy people and the lottery winning poor people who get subsidized below market rate housing, we need to start building lots of new housing. And the only way that we're gonna do that is if we reform laws like CEQA that kill housing production, and if we make it legal to build dense housing. There was an old spaghetti factory. That environmental impact report required the facade of the old spaghetti factory building to be preserved but it was a concession to the people who liked the character of the neighborhood. So they peeled it off and then they pasted it back on. They sued again, saying that peeling it off and putting it back on the stucco was a violation of CEQA. Tenants moved in. The judge came back and said, no, actually you should have done more environmental study. We're gonna vacate your project approval. Tenants had to be escorted out of that building, which remains vacant. In December of 2016, Poway City Council voted down a Habitat for Humanity development on a lot designated for affordable housing. The contractors, the builders, the painters, people that work in yards, service folks, they, they, we have a lot of that in our community. Uh, and I can't tell you where they all come from, uh, but I know they're not coming from the homes up here. And we had 800 applications before we even got the, process, the project approved of people lined up, and that was just in our region. So this is the lot that our community has cast itself into. And, and it is emblematic of everything that is ugly about the notion of providing housing for low-income folks. Habitat for Humanity put over $100,000 worth of their, you know, their money in there and thousands of hours of sweat equity and they got nothing. Many CEQA lawsuits targeting residential projects are filed by slow growth advocates, also known as NIMBYs. The unfortunate part is the environmental organizations should be the ones to enforce that CEQA is used the way it was intended to, to be used to protect the environment. 
The Redwood City Planning Commission recently approved a 20-unit condominium for 100% affordable family ownership. 612 Jefferson Avenue will offer a solution to the immense need for affordable housing in Redwood City by creating transit-oriented living opportunities in a county where a majority of employees commute from neighboring counties to work. Attorneys Jeff Carr and Kevin Frederick, who work in an office space nearby, filed a CEQA lawsuit against Redwood City. If you want to know why I'm personally angry, my office will be forever cut off from sunlight by that building. So this is personal now. Even if a proposed housing development complies with every single local rule, it still gets voted on. It can still be appealed to the city council because they have the discretion to say yes or no. That's a project under CEQA, and that gives anyone the ability to sue. Just because of the way CEQA is set up, you have all these costs to defend. There's no, you're never going to get any money back. If you win, you just get to go forward. Um, the other side, however, if they win, you, you pay the, their attorney's fees. This building, for all its good intentions, is going to be an eyesore for now and the rest of your lives. And if people think I'm Darth Vader, I don't care. <laughs> Thank you. Cities and local areas have choices, and we don't have to provide for everybody that wants to be here. The environmental movement in San Francisco and in Berkeley was largely created by professional class white people in the 1970s who had very specific aesthetic preferences. So they happen to like small town feels. They don't want anything new. And I will put every bit of energy I have to legally bring this thing down to three or four stories. Well, the only thing that would make them happy is chopping two floors off, which means no project at all. And even if, hypothetically, you could take two floors off and financially make it work, which Habitat can't do, that's six units, that's six families that don't have a home. It just, you know, just not worth it, so. <laughs> Look at the difference between the building over here the style of, in the building over there, that building was going to look just like this one until we did a CEQA suit and went after the developers. That's the power of CEQA, is to be able to scare people. Over time, CEQA is used more and more and more to protect the status quo, to prevent change, even environmentally beneficial change. I think most NIMBYs are, are thinking only about their neighborhood. If I let that mid-income housing development come close to my property, it's going to lower the value of my property. They're only looking out for themselves instead of thinking larger for what's good for the whole community. When people have heard about suits, they send letters to the editor saying, you know, I'm a NIMBY, this, that, or whatever the hell it is. And what I would want to tell them is, no, I'm very motivated about affordable housing. I just don't see this as the solution, and you're doing it on my back. They hide behind what Habitat is doing with 20 units to make the public believe they were concerned. That's bullshit. They're not concerned. If they continue to block urban infill development and continue to push Californians to Texas, Arizona, and Nevada, the three states um, that receive the most California outmigration, it's going to be an environmental catastrophe. Those states have about three times the per capita greenhouse gas emissions as California does. What we're really trying to do is to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions. The way to do that um, is to make cars more efficient, but to also drive cars less. Bike plans were challenged in San Francisco, Los Angeles. What could be more environmental? In 2016, Jerry Brown signed SB 32, which requires the state to slash greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. That 167,000 automobiles driven over the Altamont Pass here in Northern California every day. Here, environmentalists complain that automobiles are creating poor quality air because of the emissions. But on the other hand, they're opposing high density infill housing in inner cities. Many folks who developed their environmental consciousness in the 1970s um, simply haven't really changed. And in the 1970s, what they were, they were focused on things like overpopulation. Uh, environmentalism was often about stopping projects, stopping big power plants, stopping highways through urban areas. 
they, they never understood how to say yes to things. They developed their environmental consciousness before climate change was a big issue. Mostly focused on things like clean water, clean air, species protection. Those are also very, very important. But they weren't thinking of, well, what happens if we're spewing carbon and methane into the atmosphere? What is that going to do to the climate? These types of laws that restrict the um, number of homes that you can build on a certain amount of land, how high you can build, how densely, uh, the type of approvals process that we have. These laws were put into place to exclude based on race and class. They weren't so shy in 1915 when deciding why they want to only have single family homes. In Berkeley, for instance, they're very explicit. It was to keep out Chinese, to keep out black people, um, and to keep out poor people in, in apartments. Reform for CEQA involves two key changes, require transparency and eliminate duplicative lawsuits. Require disclosure of who you are and anonymous CEQA lawsuits. Allow CEQA lawsuits to be filed once but not multiple times. We have examples like Paya Vista that have been sued more than 30 times. No other environmental law lets you hide who you are. We have to broaden the pie so that everybody lives a good life, not just a selected few. Families living in habitat homes have additional positive outcomes in health, education, economic mobility. Our older son is graduating from Dartmouth College, an Ivy League, uh, with a major in biology. And I will say that all this wouldn't be possible without owning your home. When he applied, I didn't know what, we, what was an Ivy League. So then I went into the internet and I searched for what was an Ivy League. Uh, oh. With the security of homeownership, their kids go to college, they volunteer, they join boards, their kids go on to do public service. We can't underestimate the value of, of a house, a place where people can live. If we can understand the notion that affordable housing is every region's responsibility, not just the responsibility of communities that have a very poor population. We're in a country where everybody's divided by, by color, by race, by party, and now there's going to be a division between communities of color who are so far behind. It's immigrant communities saying, hey, these plans that you created for housing decades ago were meant to exclude us and we're not gonna take it anymore. Like this is a California that should be for everyone. The environmentalists spend so much time talking about getting clean air, keeping the air clean, keeping the water safe, and yet they don't think about the people what if the end result is we have a world that's really good with lots of clean water and lots of clean air, but we don't have any people that are healthy 